I should like to call your attention this evening to the words which are to be found in the book of the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 26 and verse 25, the 25th verse in the 26th chapter of the book of the Acts of the Apostles, which we read at the beginning. But he, Paul, said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. This is uh, admittedly one of the great uh, dramatic chapters of the Bible, uh, containing uh, an account of this famous interview between the Apostle Paul, the servant of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the Roman governor Festus and King Agrippa and their wives and the members of the court. It is one of the great dramatic scenes of all history, often commented upon, has often been painted, and it's not surprising, because you have gathered together in this one chapter all the elements and ingredients which are necessary to a great and a famous and a dramatic occasion. And one cannot but uh, express one's admiration uh, for the extraordinary manner in which the scene is presented to us by Luke, who is undoubtedly the recorder and historian of this famous happening. But uh, this evening I'm concerned not to call your attention merely uh, to the dramatic character of the incident. We must of necessity be interested in it as it presents to us the truth because that is really the message of this great chapter. It reminds us of the essential Christian message and at the same time it reminds us of the way in which men and women react to that message. In other words, we have in this chapter an account of what is happening at this very moment in this service. I have the privilege of standing before you to preach and to present to you the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and you are listening to it in exactly the same way the Apostle Paul presented it to this distinguished company, and they listened to it. So you have here, at one and the same time, the presentation of the message. We are reminded of what the message is in its essence, and we are shown how people, different people, respond to it and react to it. Now we are shown that in a number of instances, we are actually shown it all in the case of the Apostle Paul himself. Because here he indulges in a bit of autobiography. He had to do so. He was on trial. He was a prisoner. And he has to justify himself and his position. He was asked to do so. So he has to do so. And uh, so he tells them about himself how at one time he was a bitter opponent of the Christian message. He hated the Lord Jesus Christ and all that he stood for and all that was claimed for him. And he considered that he was doing God's service when he did his utmost to exterminate Christians and Christianity. He was once a man who reacted violently against this gospel. But then he goes on to tell us how he became a believer in it. And how he not only became a believer in it but a preacher of it. And how he'd spent his time ever after traveling backwards and forwards in different countries preaching this gospel that he had once revived. Now there it is all in one man, you see. The same message, first of all disliked and rejected, then believed and gloried in and preached. Then, of course, we've got these other examples and uh, illustrations which are provided by Festus and King Agrippa and so on. 
Now the interesting thing one must uh, notice, of course, is this. That the apostle, once he had become a Christian and a preacher of the gospel, began to find people doing exactly the same thing with his presentation of the message as he had done previously with the message as it had come to him. And here it is, I say, all put before us. He finds repeated in other people the same attitude, the same reaction, the same position exactly as he himself had formerly occupied and which, of which he was formerly guilty. Now, it's about all that I want to, to speak to you this evening. Because this gospel is something that always produces a response. You can't listen to this without reacting to it. And there are only two possible reactions. You either believe in it and come to see it's the most wonderful thing in the world or else you reject it. Well now, the tragedy still is that there are large numbers of people who reject it, even as they did at the beginning, as Saul of Tarsus once did, and as this distinguished company did on this famous occasion. Now, there are many reasons which people give for their rejection of the gospel. Several of them are mentioned in this one chapter. There are some who have no interest in the gospel, because they think they are already religious. That was the position of Saul of Tarsus. He was very keen on what he calls the Jew's religion. And because he thought that that Jew's religion was right, he disliked this. This was an upstart religion to him. This Jesus of Nazareth was a blasphemer. He had no right to speak at all about God. Who was he? He wasn't a Pharisee after all, and had never had any training. He was an imposter. No, said Saul of Tarsus, the true religion is the Jews' religion I've already got, and I don't want this other religion, talking about a crucified Savior, and a physical resurrection, and a new birth of the Spirit. There are still many people like that. They reject the true gospel because they're religious. They've got their own little religion. It's a man-made religion, as the Jews' religion was. But they've got it, and because they think that's the right way, they have no use for this gospel, and they hate it, and they detest it. That's a strange thing, isn't it? But it's very true. You will find, if you read the long history of the Christian church, and especially of the saints, that it is our less often the case that those who are religious within the church have been the foremost persecutors of the true reformers and the prophets of God. Religion can cause people to reject the Christian gospel. That's one. Another one that is mentioned here is this, that some people reject it because, as they would put it, they feel that it is scientifically impossible. Paul puts that in these words. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? Now, you see, there were certain people even 2,000 years ago who said, we can't possibly believe this gospel because the very center and basis of this gospel is that what they call, the one they call Jesus of Nazareth, the Lord Jesus Christ, was raised from the dead. Well, they say, that's good enough. You needn't go any further. That's impossible. No one can be raised from the dead. It is an utter impossibility. So Paul says, why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? But to these people it was incredible. It just did not happen, and therefore it hadn't happened. And there was no need to say any more. And there are thousands like that this evening. But they say, you are gospel, it's, it's, uh, it's a patent impossibility, it's full of miracles. And we know very well that miracles don't happen. Science proves that. A miracle is an impossibility. It's therefore incredible. That's the attitude. Resurrection of the dead. Who's ever seen a dead corpse suddenly standing up and speaking? Impossible. Incredible. Therefore, they have nothing to do with it. There are thousands like that this evening. It is a thing to them incredible that God should raise the dead. 
It's all right, says the men. You know, I have to approach these things as a scientist. I'm trained scientifically. I'm not a poet. I, I don't indulge in fantasies and so on. My approach, of course, is the scientific one. And having this approach, and as I am accustomed to things I can see and measure and so on, well, of course, the whole thing is put out of court at the very beginning. Impossible. That's another reason. And then there is a third reason mentioned in this uh, chapter, and I'm only dealing with the ones mentioned here. I'm not uh, going any further this evening. The third one is, of course, the view that regards being Christian as uh, a psychological condition. Represented, you see, by Festus, who suddenly interrupted Paul with a loud voice and said, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth make thee mad. Paul, you're raving, he said. Man, you're beside yourself. You've become a psychological case. You don't know what you're talking about. You're inventing things. You're seeing things. You're talking about visions and appearances and resurrections and so on and so forth. Paul, this is nonsense. I admit you're a great man and you're a very learned man. But like many a similar man before you, you've spent so much time with your books and your learning and your meditations and contemplations. You've just gone mad. You've become a psychological case, man. The terminology has changed, but the attitude is still the same in the case of large numbers of people. Ah, they say he's got the religious complex. It's a psychological trouble, this. He's gone soft. Good man, no doubt, and an able man. Well, yes, but you see, no man is perfect. And, uh, well, for some reason or other, it may have been the stress of life, or he may have been studying too hard or something, or some strange influences have been brought to bear upon him. He's just lost his balance a little. He's prepared to believe anything now. Swallows miracles. Believe anything you like to put before him. He indulges in fantasies. He's just become a psychological case. Now, that's been a very common attitude in this century, as you know. And, of course, the psychologists uh, come to us and they say, of course, we don't want to be unkind, we don't want to be unfair, but, of course, with our psychological knowledge, we do know that people have these different complexes. And uh, that's a common one. At least it was a very common one, but as we are becoming more balanced and trained and educated and scientific... We suffer less and less from complexes, so Christianity is on the way out. It's waning, it's disappearing, the churches are empty and so on. The whole thing was always psychological. The primitive people imagined things and they saw spirits in stones and trees and in the stars. And people have always been ready to invent these fantasies and so on. But as, as we are becoming more enlightened, we are moving out of it. Well, there are some of the reasons. But now it seems to me that the whole point of this great chapter is just to say this. That while different people give different reasons in that way for their not being Christian and for their rejection of the Christian faith, in fact, there are only two reasons why anybody is not a Christian. They'll give you a thousand and one, and be a, it'll be a different one from case to case. But there's a common denominator. In fact, actually, there are only two reasons why people are not Christian. And they are the two that are mentioned in my text this evening. Listen to them. But Paul said, I am not mad, most noble Festus. But speak forth the words of truth and soberness. Truth and soberness. Now let's look at them together. Men and women, I say, who are not Christians are in that position, first of all, because they have failed to realize that Christianity is a matter of truth, facts. 
That's what the apostle means. You see, he's interrupted suddenly in his speech, in his address by Festus. Paul, thou art beside thyself much learning, doth make thee mad. No, no, most noble Festus, says Paul, I'm not mad. I'm not beside myself. I am not seeing things and imagining things. I'm not raving. I am speaking the words of truth. Now, what's he mean by this? Well, let me put it to you in this form. His case is that he is dealing with facts. With historical facts. That's what he means by truth. He's just been giving them a number of facts. He says, I'm not raving. I'm not imagining or seeing things. I'm simply reciting historical facts, events. Now, this, I say, is the first reason why people are not Christians. They haven't realized that. They've somehow started off with the idea that uh, this Christianity is uh, mainly a matter of teaching. It's a matter of uh, a theory. It's a matter of a philosophy or a view of life. You ask the average person, stop anybody and ask them at random, what's a Christian? What's your idea of a Christian? And you'll probably find they'll say something like that. Well, Christianity is that which takes a, a given view of life. It's a teaching. It's a philosophy. It's a point of view. It's a theory. Or they may say that it's just a matter of a number of religious ideas. Like the Old Testament, the Jewish religion, there were religious ideas. Paul had got his religious ideas. And people think that this is just a question of religious ideas. Uh, they say, of course, all the great religions are much the same. They've all got a common denominator, a common factor. They differ on the surface, but essentially all religions are the same. They're all religious. So they put Christianity in series with Hinduism and Buddhism and Confucianism and so on and so forth. Or there are many who seem to think that it's just a matter of feeling. What is to be Christian? Well, to be Christian, they think, is to have a good feeling inside you. To feel friendly, to feel loving, to feel kind to feel well disposed towards people, to hate war, to be generally nice and benevolent and helpful. And there are many, it seems to me, who regard even the business of the Christian church as being just something that promotes that sort of feeling within people, so that when they come to a service such as this, what they expect is to be made to feel happier than they were before, or to feel nicer. They don't expect to have a number of facts put before them. No, but uh, perhaps a story or two and uh, some affecting incident. And you get a nice, comfortable feeling. And, uh, well, it's, uh, it's all right while it lasts. But then you go back into the great world with its problems. And, of course, you've soon lost it again. It's just a matter of feeling. And then there are large numbers who seem to think that it's just a question of doing good or of being good. And that the whole business of Christian preaching is just to plead with people to be good. And to do good. And to stop doing that which is bad and evil. And to appeal to people to pull together for the sake of the country or for the sake of humanity or for the sake of the world and so on and so forth. A great moral appeal and nothing more. But my friends, while there is an element of truth in all those things, that's not Christianity. You can have all that without Christianity. Other religions can give you that. The cults can give you that. What is it that, what is it that makes Christianity Christianity? Well, Paul tells us facts, history, truth. I'm not romancing, he says. I'm not philosophizing. I am stating sober facts. And he's already been rehearsing some of them to them. And my dear friends, if you and I go from this service tonight without facing certain historical facts, we have not faced Christianity or the Christian message. You know, the Bible is not a book of moral exhortation, it's a book of facts. It's a book that tells us that God created the world out of nothing. That's a fact. It tells us that he created men and put him in the world. That's a fact. 
It tells us that men sinned in his folly and went wrong and brought chaos down upon himself and his world. That's a fact. And we are living witnesses of it, every one of us. That's what the Bible is talking about. It's a book of facts. And on and on the story goes. Individuals, people, a flood, a tower of Babel, a man called Abram, Ur of the Chaldees, coming out, given a land called Canaan, son born to him called Isaac. He has two sons, Jacob and Esau. History, facts, that's what it's about. And there is no Christianity apart from these facts. And on and on the facts go. How God kept on speaking to these people and saying, Yes, you're in trouble and your world's in trouble and everything is sinful, but I'm going to do something about it. I've made this world and I'm still interested in this world. And I'm going to send a deliverer into this world. He kept on promising it. And eventually, we come to the New Testament, and again, it's full of facts. What's Christianity about? I'll tell you. Christianity starts with this, the birth of a babe in a place called Bethlehem. That's Christianity. Ah, it's not an idealistic view of life. It's not that I feel nice and comfortable and feel that I'm going to be a little bit better than I've been in the past. You can have all that without Christianity. Christianity starts by saying this, look here, did you know that nearly 2,000 years ago in a little place called Bethlehem and in a stable, a child was born, born to a virgin who wasn't married, who hadn't a human father, and they called him Jesus and put him in a manger. That's the beginning of Christianity. And then the story goes on to tell us how this child grew and uh, all about him. It tells us how he was there in the temple at the age of 12, showing an amazing knowledge which the doctors of the law couldn't equal. An amazing boy, this. And then how for 18 years he worked as a carpenter, and we know very little about that time. And then at the age of 30, he began to preach. He went to John the Baptist and said, I want to be baptized. And John the Baptist said, you want to be baptized? I uh, ought to be baptized by you, not you by me. No, no, he said, suffer it to be so now, for thus it behoveth us to fulfill all righteousness. And he was baptized. And as he came up out of the water, the Holy Ghost descended upon him in the form of a dove. That's what Christianity is about, facts. That's what you've got in your four Gospels, isn't it? He preached. He expounded God's law. He worked miracles. It's a part of the story. These are all facts. And then after three years of it, he'd aroused so much antagonism and enmity and bitterness on the part of the Pharisees and scribes and the Sadducees and the doctors of the law that they conspired to get rid of him and they come... They arrested him and took him before the Roman governor. And eventually, after a most shocking trial, with no evidence against him at all, they condemned him. And they nailed him to a tree. And he died. And they took down his body and they put it in a grave. And they rolled a stone onto the face of that grave. And then, because they were afraid that his followers might come and steal the body and say that he'd so or other risen from the dead, they said, seal it, put a seal there and put soldiers to guard. And they did that. Facts. But in spite of that, he rose out of that grave. So that when they went to look for him in the grave, he wasn't there. They found the grave clothes, but him they didn't find. He'd risen. And he manifested himself for 40 days to certain chosen persons. And then some of them, while he was speaking to them on the top of a mountain, saw him rising to heaven and disappearing. And then in seven weeks, when a number of them were gathered together in Jerusalem, suddenly the place in which they were was shaken. And cloven tongues as a fire descended upon them. 
And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And were transformed and began to preach. That's what Christianity is about. That's the kind of thing that Saul of Tarsus had been hearing. That's the sort of thing he hated, but he'd heard it. He, the facts had been reported to him. That is Christianity, I say. It is essentially a matter of history. It's a matter of concrete facts. Those things have literally taken place. Now, that's the first proposition, but let me come to the second. These facts are well-attested facts. Now, the apostle brings that out by putting it like this, you, you notice. He says, I am not madness, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and of soberness, for the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely, for I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him, for this thing was not done in a corner. This thing being... The, the crucifixion and the burial and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and all the other facts about it. This thing wasn't done in a corner. There has never been an event which has been more public than the facts concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul very rightly, as an able advocate, he appeals to the king. King Agrippa knew all about it. King Agrippa was married to a Jewess, though he was uh, an Idumean himself, and he was interested in the Jews' religion, and he knew all about these facts, and he can't deny them. He knew they were true. There were thousands of people who'd seen Jesus of Nazareth. They'd witnessed his miracles. They'd seen him dying on the cross. They were witnesses of the facts. The thing wasn't done in a corner. Even the Roman governor was a witness to the facts. They had taken him to Pilate. Pilate had spoken to him and had questioned him. A report concerning him was even sent to the emperor in Rome, and there it is to be seen still in the records. These things were not done in a corner. These things belong to history. As definitely as the conquest of this country by Julius Caesar belongs to history. As long as, t uh, as surely as 1066 and William the Conqueror is history. So this is history. Well attested, well authenticated. This thing was not done in a corner. That's what Christianity said. But then you notice it says another thing which is equally important, which I'll put like this. All these facts which constitute the Christian message, all of them have been foretold. These facts are nothing but the fulfillment of prophecy. Listen to Paul saying that. He says this is an extraordinary position. Uh, he says that I have been persecuted like this from the Jews, by the Jews, but I've kept on. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue until this day, witnessing both the small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer, and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead, and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. And that was a very vital part of Paul's preaching. That was a vital part of the preaching of every other single apostle. This was their message in a sense. Here they said are the facts about Jesus of Nazareth. Can't you see, they said to the Jews who knew their Old Testaments, can't you see that all these things have been prophesied in the Old Testament, in your scriptures? Don't you remember reading in the 16th Psalm, they said, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Has that ever been fulfilled? They said, No, it hasn't until now, but now it has. So they took them through the prophecies which are to be found in the Psalms and in the prophets and indeed in the ceremonial and in the types 
that God gave to Moses on the mount to teach to the children of Israel, their resurrection is prophesied and predicted. It runs right through the Old Testament. The death of Christ, the Lamb, the Paschal Lamb, and then the resurrection, prophesied by Moses and the prophets. And now, fulfilled and verified. I am not mad, most noble Festus. Is a man mad who states a number of facts? Is it madness just to teach history? Is it madness to show that this Jesus has enacted in his own life and death and resurrection the very things that were prophesied concerning the coming Messiah? I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak the words of truth. These things were not done in a corner. He was a public person. His life was public. His death was public. The empty grave is public. Very well, my friends. There is the first proposition. And I simply leave it by asking a question. Have you considered those facts? Now, the question is not whether Christianity is a good thing or not. It's not the question, what's the Christian attitude towards war or peace or industry? Or why doesn't the Christian church do something about putting an end to war? Or what's it got to say about this or that? That's not the question. The first question is this. Here are a series of events which have taken place in history. Have you looked at them? Have you considered them? The second thing is this. Men and women are not Christian. Not only because so many of them have ever have failed ever to consider the facts even, but secondly, because they fail to reason truly from the facts and to draw the right and the inevitable deductions from the facts. I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. What does soberness mean? Well, soberness means a sound mind. Soberness is not the opposite of being drunk. Soberness is the opposite here of madness. It's the opposite of being a raving lunatic. It means a man with a balanced, controlled, sane, reasoning, logical mind who's capable of deductions. And that is the reply which the apostle makes to Festus. Festus, he says, most noble Festus. There has never been a time in my life when I've been less of a raving lunatic than now. It's now I'm being reasonable. It's now I'm being sane. There was a time when, as I've just been telling you, when I went down from Jerusalem to Damascus, breathing out threatenings and slaughter. I was mad then. But I'm sane now. Then I didn't reason I was a creature of prejudice and of violence. But now I'm sane, I'm sober, I'm reasoning, I'm calculating. Let me put that then in this form. And I do it with the greatest possible respect. To be a Christian is to have a sound mind. Let me prove to you what I'm saying. Is there anything which is more foolish and more unreasonable than to ignore or to refuse to face facts? I could illustrate that to you endlessly. I wonder whether it isn't perhaps the major problem in this country at the moment that people simply are not prepared to face facts. 
And they won't face facts because they don't want to. We all want to have a good time. We want to carry on with things as they are. Facts, we don't want them. They're unpleasant. So don't look at them. But isn't that sheer lunacy? How many a man has gone to a drunkard's grave, I wonder, simply because he wouldn't listen to facts? How many a business has gone wrong because a man simply would not face the facts? His accountant may draw his attention to it. Oh. Pessimism, he's not interested. Facts, oh. he's got ideas. What are facts to ideas? Brushes them aside. How many a man has died and gone to an early grave because he wouldn't pay attention to facts? He paid no attention to that flush which he began to experience every evening or to that uh, loss of energy or to that persistent cough that wouldn't go. There were the facts and people said, well now look here, go and see a doctor, go and be examined. No, I shall be all right, says the man. He will not face facts. And eventually it's too late. Oh, I needn't keep you. A man who doesn't face facts is a fool. That's lunacy, that's madness. But contrarywise to face facts is obviously the essence of sanity. So Paul is justified in saying, I am not mad, most noble Festus. I have faced the facts. Have you? But wait a minute. In the second place, I would suggest that it is always the essence of wisdom to pay unusual attention to vital, pivotal, and momentous facts. There are facts and facts, of course. All facts are not equal in importance and in value. There are some things, some events, which are, are much more important to us than others. But I'm simply arguing that it is a sign of a man of wisdom and of understanding that he pays great attention to the big thing. I mean, a man in business who spends his time over the pennies and the halfpennies isn't showing that he's a great businessman. He watches the big figures. He's got somebody else to do that. But he, he says, I'll give my attention to the big things, the central things, quite right. Doesn't waste his time with the mere detail. But a man who doesn't pay attention to great, pivotal, central, momentous facts is again, I say, nothing but a fool. Very well, then, this is the position as regards Christianity. The facts recorded in this book are the greatest and the most momentous facts in all human history. Now I'm speaking quietly, deliberately, advisedly. I am asserting that the facts recorded here stand out in importance and in significance far away and above every other fact in history. I know about the great turning points in history. I don't want to detract from their value. I've mentioned some of them already, 55 B.C., 1066, 1485, some of these great climactic turning points of history, tremendously important, and it is our business as citizens, intelligent citizens, to know our history and to know exactly these great events that have molded the whole future of the human race. But I say, attached to them, the maximum value to which they're entitled. And not one of them, indeed, I go so far as to say that all of them put together dwindle into insignificance and nothing when you put them by the side of these facts. What are these facts? Well, they mean this, don't they? These are facts which assert 
that into this world of time and into the field of human history the very Son of God himself has come. Nothing less. That, that is the whole basis of this message. That is the result, the only deduction that can be drawn from these astounding events to which I've been directing your attention. Has anybody before ever been born of a virgin without a human father? Or since? Has anyone ever worked miracles as he did? Can you explain him in human terms? Has anyone risen from the dead as he did? And the answer is no. He stands alone. He stands apart. There's only one explanation of him. He is what he said he was, the eternal Son of God. He is God, the second person come down to earth, taking upon him a human nature. And he lived and died and rose again. That is the statement. Now I am just arguing, as Paul argued with Festus, that it is the essence of wisdom to face that fact. I know all about your kings and princes and emperors and all about your great battles of history and the rising of a dynasty and the falling of a dynasty. I agree, it's all tremendously important. But my dear friend, here is something I say, the towers over them all. That nearly 2,000 years ago there entered into this world of time. God's own Son. It is the essence of wisdom, I say, to pay unusual attention to this and to say whatever else I'm interested in or I'm not interested in, I must come to terms with this tremendous fact and all that happened to it. But that leads me to my next deduction, which I put in this form. That it is of the essence of wisdom to understand the meaning of these facts and to deduce from them their inevitable teaching. And this is not difficult for us because our Lord himself expounded it. You'll find it in the four Gospels. You'll find it especially in the teaching he gave his disciples after his resurrection from the dead. He took them through the Old Testament scriptures and explained them. He explained himself and why he'd come and what he'd come to do. It's all there for us. Not only that, he explained it to this man, Saul of Tarsus, on the road to Damascus. He's just been telling Festus and King Agrippa how going down, breathing out threatenings and slaughter against this Jesus and his followers, he suddenly saw that light and fell helpless to the ground. And then the voice came and said, Saul, Saul, why dost thou persecute me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he in astonishment said, Who art thou, Lord? It was obvious that he was a Lord. He'd never seen a face like that before. This speaker was divine. The brightness and the glory had actually blinded him. Who art thou, Lord? And back came the last answer he ever expected to receive. I said that amazing person with that beautiful, divine, glorious face. I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. And then you remember how he went on to tell him that he'd appeared thus to him because he'd chosen him to be one of his preachers. He said, I'm sending you now to the Jews and to the Gentiles to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan and to God that they might have an inheritance among them that are sanctified by faith that is in me. And ever since, says Paul, I've just been doing that with the power that he's given me. I have just gone round the world telling people these facts 
and drawing the deductions for them and asking them to believe. Well, what are these deductions? What is this teaching that is based upon these facts? Well, let me just summarize it for you. You notice he's already said that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles, the people being the Jews. What is this light that Jesus Christ has come to give? This is the momentous deduction. Why did the Son of God ever leave the courts of heaven and come on earth and be born as a babe and live and die and rise again? It's to give us light, my friends. Light on what? Light on ourselves. Light which shows us this, that we are all of us estranged from God, that we are all of us sinners, that we are all of us, as he puts it, in the power of Satan to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. That's the light he's come to give. He says so himself. In other words, I can put it simply and briefly in this form. What he has come to tell us and to teach us is that we are as we are because we don't know God and because we are not blessed of God. It's because we sin against God. That's why the world is as it is. That's why the nations are all suspecting one another and are jealous and envious. That's why you have all the tensions. That's why marriages break down. That's why men fall into sin. It's this evil thing that Satan has put into us. He suggested it at the beginning, and he's gone on suggesting it. Christ opens our eyes to that. Men and women are not aware of this. That's why they reject all this, you see. They don't like it. They don't want to face it. They want to carry on as they are. But this is your trouble, says Christ. That's why you are as you are. You're a sinner, and you're estranged from God. But it's even more serious than that. Because that is our condition, we are all of us under the wrath of God. God, being eternally holy, hates sin. And he can't pretend it isn't there. The wrath of God is upon all sin. I've, I never tire of quoting this verse because the modern world seems to me to be such an absolute proof of its truth. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. Which means this, that it doesn't matter what that wicked person does, it doesn't matter how clever he is, how able, how wealthy, how learned, he shall not enjoy peace. And he doesn't. And it's because he's under the wrath of God. But of course the most serious thing of all is this. That men and the world thus in sin will have to face the judgment of God. Jesus Christ has come to give us light on that. This self-same Apostle Paul in preaching in Athens said that the resurrection is God's public announcement and proclamation to the whole world that he is going to judge the world in righteousness by Jesus Christ. That's what these facts say. Why did the Son of God leave heaven and come to earth? This is the only answer. It is because, as he put it, he has come to seek and to save that which is lost. It's because man is helpless in sin and in the mess he's made of life, and he cannot deliver himself. He's tried and he's failed. Why has the Son of God come? Because all else had failed. But thank God he has come 
in order to save. That is why he entered the virgin's womb. That is why he died upon the cross. That is why he rose again to deliver us from the wrath to come. He came to bear our sins and their punishment that God might reconcile us unto himself and forgive us. And he has come to give us salvation that they might have an inheritance among them that are sanctified by faith that is in me. That's what he means by that. He has come to deliver me from the fear of death and the fear of judgment. He has come to deliver me from the power of Satan and the power of sin. He has come to deliver me from misery and wretchedness and squalor and failure in every respect. He has come to make me a child of God to make it possible for God to shower his blessings upon me. That's what he's come for. He says so. He told Paul to go and preach that to the nations. Tell them about the facts, he says, what you've seen and what you've been told, and draw the deductions. And there are the deductions. I am not mad, most noble Festus, But speak forth the words of truth and of soberness. I will put it like this to you. I am confronted by the fact that God's own Son came into this world and died on a cross and rose again. And I ask, why? And the only answer I see is this. He did it all because it was the only way to save me from hell. I've got to go on living even after I die. Death is not the end. There is a judgment, there is God, and there is eternity. And you and I are going on to that. That's what Christianity is about. Am I a raving lunatic in this pulpit? Because I ask you to face things like that. My friends, I've never been so sane. I tell you that any man who doesn't start with the fact of his own certain death is a fool. You've got to die. And you've got to face God. And to face these facts is the essence of wisdom. Very well, I say, face them. Face your sin, face your failure. Face the holiness of God and his righteousness. Face the failure of the greatest saints. Who are you to succeed? And then face him. Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God. He rose from the grave, proclaiming thereby that he is the Son of God and that he came into the world as it had been prophesied to die for your sins, to rise again to justify you before God, to deliver you from the power of Satan, to turn you to God. Have you faced these facts? Have you faced this truth? Have you soberly drawn your deductions? If you haven't, you're a fool. If you have, you're wise. And you can prove to me that you've done it. This is the way, says Paul. If you really believe these truths, these facts, and draw the deduction without a second's delay, you will repent. You will bring forth works meet for repentance. 
You will go to God and you'll say, Oh God, I see it at last. I've lived without realizing my position. I didn't think of you. I thought this life was all. I said these are fairy tales. I laughed at them. I didn't believe the gospel. I see it all now. And I want to be right with you. I therefore confess and acknowledge my sin. I see I've been a fool. Is there still acceptance for me? I have nothing to plead in mitigation. I've ignored the facts. I see them now and I'm without defense. And God will tell you, if you so go to him that he has so loved you, that he sent his only begotten son into the world and even to the cross, for you. I care not if you've been living in the very jaws of hell. I care not how black your soul is. I care not how vile your character may have become. Whatever you are, whoever you are, go to him in repentance. Acknowledge your sinfulness, your vileness, your madness. And as that blessed Lord forgave Saul of Tarsus all his folly and his madness, he'll forgive you all. And he'll assure you that he died for you, that your sins are already forgiven, and he'll give you new life and make you a new man and give you new power and enable you to live with God, for God. And so when you die, you'll have nothing to fear. Because it will mean going to be with Christ, which is far better. This isn't madness. This is truth. This is history. This is wisdom facing the facts and drawing the inevitable deduction. Have you done it? Have you repented? Have you acknowledged and confessed your sin to God? Have you realized that your only hope is in Christ, the Son of God, who died for you and rose again? If you haven't, I beseech you. I don't know your name. Let me call you Festus. Most noble Festus. Face it now. Not madness. Truth. Soberness. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.